Okay, good afternoon. Couple things before we get started today. So uh, I am gonna have some additional office hours on Thursday after lecture. So I'm planning on being in my office till four o'clock that day. Um, just turn this down a little bit. Um, I was thinking of, um, trying to be available Friday morning, but I, I actually have an appointment Friday morning, so I can't make that work. If you want to meet on, I don't like the way this is, let's try that. If you want to meet on Friday afternoon, I could do that by Zoom, all right? So some additional office hours on Thursday because our next exam is a week from today. So I know they come kind of fast and furious. Um, I'm hoping, once I get the exam finalized, I'll get some practice questions out for you, hopefully by Thursday uh, at the latest or perhaps Friday. Uh, the next exam will cover metabolism chapter five, our bacterial genetics, which we're gonna finish today, uh, which is chapter seven. And then we're gonna start today, chapter 13 viruses. And I'm hoping to get pretty much through the viruses uh, by Thursday's exam. So. Just those three chapters, the, the bacterial genetics chapter, homework is a little bit longer. So after we uh, are done with lecture today, hopefully you can get going on that genetics homework. There's, there's really lots of, lots of good animations there. So again, I encourage you to, to take your time with that homework. Um, I just, I did want to revisit, I stumbled a little bit when we were talking about the way transcription is terminated. Uh, because I was trying to decide whether to stop and to write this out on the, on the board or not, and I didn't really want to do that. Um, remember the two ways transcription stops. It either involves that rho protein, which remember is a helicase protein, um, or it doesn't involve helicase. It involves some kind of inverted sequence in the DNA. Um, and, and just, you know, if, if you want to picture how that works, it's not really a palindrome, like in, in, you know, a name that's a palindrome is Hannah, it's the same forward and back. It's not exactly the same, it's, it's more like you have a sequence in DNA that when it can fly over on itself and be complementary. Okay, so that's how that the hairpin loop gets formed uh, in the RNA transcript and that provides the tension that helps transcription stop. So, just to kind of fill in when I, um, I couldn't decide whether to stop and explain that last time or not. I didn't really want to take the time. Okay, so to finish up, yeah, question. Okay, so how to study. Yeah, I mean, your text is a good reference. I probably wouldn't spend your time reading the textbook in the few days before the exam. Um, I take exam questions from things that we have talked about in lecture and the lecture notes. So uh, use your learning objectives to kind of be sure that you're kind of covering everything that you should and just try to quiz yourself as much as you can. So think, okay, if I had to tell somebody else about mutation, what would I tell them? What did we talk about? And if you're coming up blank, you need to go back and look at it and, and try again. So, okay. Um, all right, so a few kind of things to, to wrap up here in our discussion of genetics. Uh, we need to talk a little bit about mutation. So what happens uh, if the genetic uh, sequences change or those bases are changed? Usually mutation is going to be bad, right? It, there's the rare circumstance that, that might, you know, might have a beneficial mutation for the organism, but usually that's gonna be bad. Uh, we're going to think about um, some things that cause mutation. 
uh, and as well as briefly what an organism could do to fix those mutations. Uh, and one other way that an organism's uh, DNA can be altered is by horizontal gene transfer. So there's three different ways that an organism can kind of share their genes with uh, another, another, another bacteria. So that's what we do need to do to finish up here. Uh, the mutation is, is a, a, pretty much, this is really kind of straightforward, just some terminology, but what is a mutation? It's a permanent change in the DNA or RNA sequence. So we're gonna look mostly at what happens when you, uh, a bacteria might have a point mutation. So that just means that there's one nucleotide that's changed. Um, either there's a, a base there that's uh, instead of the correct one, or you have an additional base, uh, really a whole nucleotide put in there, inserted in there, or maybe one taken away. So how that how is that going to affect what ultimately gets what protein ultimately gets made? Um, just be aware that there are other kinds of mutations. We call them gross mutations because they involve more than one nucleotide or one base. Um, and, and we're not going to really explore that anymore, but there can be uh, inversions where nucleotides get kind of flipped around or copied or maybe whole short sequences moved to another part of the genome in a, in a transposition. So just be aware that that there can be some more serious mutations, but we're gonna just look at what happens with our point mutations here. Okay, so this is the figure that I posted, uh, the one in your book that kind of goes through a little terminology here. Um, I'm gonna, this is a little bit small for us to all kind of go through together. So uh, I'm gonna kind of break this down. Uh, I can kind of blow it up here a little bit. There we go. Um, but again, it's, it's taken from that, that same figure. So um, if we've got our, our normal, say a bacterial DNA uh, transcript, or sorry, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, the DNA, uh, let's call it a template strand. So remember the template, you just you've got two strands of DNA and the strand that uh, the RNA polymerase uses to transcribe RNA, we call that the template strand. There would be another strand over here, which would be the coding strand. Okay, so say this is the messenger RNA that's made from the template and then the normal sequence of amino acids that would result from that. So again, looking at those uh, codons on the messenger RNA and you check your genetic code and see which amino acid would correspond to each codon. All right, so what happens if this base right here, this adenine uh, is changed to a guanine. So maybe there's been some chemical mutagen, maybe the DNA polymerase three just made a very rare mistake and inserted the wrong base in there. Okay, so, so what would happen instead of U, 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 we would have a U, U, C there. But if you check the genetic code and I don't expect you to have that memorized, Remember, there's some degeneracy built into that. And actually, UUU and UUC both encode for the same amino acid, phenylalanine. All right, so we would call this a silent mutation. It didn't make any difference into the amino acid that was uh, lined up there. Okay, so no change in amino acid sequence. Uh, what if... Uh, this guanine up here, wait for, right, it's kind of slow today, but if this guanine uh, was changed to a cytosine, okay, so now instead of GCA, we would have GGA, and that encodes for glycine instead of alanine, okay, so it makes sense in that some amino acid is inserted in there, but it's not the right sense, all right? So we would call this a missense mutation, okay? So a slightly different amino acid sequence uh, is going to result. How much a difference is that gonna make in the protein? Uh, remember we said the average protein has about 300 amino acids. So what's one difference? 
it may not actually make any difference at all. It depends where it is in that protein and if it's at a crucial place. Um, it could make a, a, a huge difference. It could mean that the protein's not functional, uh, but not necessarily. <laughs> okay. Uh, what if you had a, another point mutation where this adenine was changed to a thymine? Okay, now instead of UAU, it's going to be read UAA, and that happens to encode for a stop codon. So that means that translation will, will terminate. Uh, and the whole rest of, of those amino acids are not going to get made into the, the polysaccharide, polypeptide, all right? So we call this a nonsense mutation because this is likely to be catastrophic. Like you're not usually going to have a protein that's functional if you stop at it at some point. Now, maybe if it was at the very end, maybe the protein would still be functional, but uh, if it's in the beginning or the middle, then, then not likely. So uh, just kind of remembering the difference between missense and nonsense is probably uh, the most difficult thing there. Okay. Well, internet's slow here today. Uh, so what if you had some kind of insertion? So here we've got uh, a thymine that's inserted uh, where it, it shouldn't be up here. Uh, so what happens then, it, the whole reading frame gets thrown off. So instead of reading you know, the normal codon, codons here, um, it's actually, like I said, gonna be off by one. So, you're going to end up with major difference in amino acid sequence because after that insertion, everything beyond that is just, just going to be off. So that's likely to be, again, a huge difference. Same thing's going to result if you have a deletion where, again, the whole frame ship gets, gets moved off and uh, you're going to have just Again, a major, major difference in the amino acid sequence, uh, different even than if you had an insertion. Okay. Uh, so it's just a little bit of terminology there and kind of thinking through, you know, how, how really just one little thing can make a huge difference. All right, so what sort of things can cause mutation? Uh, the first thing that we typically think about is some kind of radiation uh, causing mutation. Okay, so if we think about uh, different wavelengths of light, uh, and remember what I mean by wavelength of light, if you're measuring uh, crest to crest, right, that's one wavelength, or maybe you could measure trough to trough, that, that's a wavelength. Um, your longer wavelengths of light are going to give you your radio waves, your microwaves, your infrared rays. Visible light is between 400 and 700 nanometer wavelength. Uh, and then shorter than visible light, we start, again, we get increasing energy as the wavelength gets shorter and shorter. So uh, our ultraviolet rays, uh, that's going to be somewhere between 10-ish and, and 400 or 300 typically. Uh, below that, that's ultraviolet is considered non-ionizing radiation. Get back to our other slide where I have that written. Uh, and below that, this is our ionizing radiation, our X-rays and our gamma rays. All right, so increasing energy as a wavelength gets shorter and shorter. Um, and we can actually use X-rays and gamma rays, especially gamma rays when we're trying to kill organisms. So we'll talk about that when we get into our next chapter. But, but what kind of harm does each kind of radiation cause or what kind of mutations? Um, ionizing radiation, like I said, this is gamma rays and X-rays. Um, what, what does that do to, to DNA in particular? But um, 
cellular molecules, it's going to pull electrons from other molecules. Okay, uh, it makes ions. Okay, ionizing radiation pulls off electrons from other molecules to make ions. So this is going to cause all sorts of, of damage in the cell. Um, among other things, it has the potential to actually break the DNA. Okay, uh, both both uh, backbones of that double helix. Okay, so that's there's other damages that it can cause. It can actually modify uh, a base uh, into something that won't get read correctly the next time. Uh, it can break one or both of those sugar phosphate backbones of the DNA or, or break the hydrogen bonds in between the bases. So uh, all kinds of really catastrophic damage. Uh, if one side, if you know, if one strand of DNA is intact, it can be used as a template to, you know, make its corresponding uh, side. But again, if they're both broken, then it's it's hard for the DNA to to recover from that. Uh, Non-ionizing radiation, uh, again, that's our ultraviolet light. Um, that causes a very specific kind of mutation called a uh, pyrimidine. Dimer. Okay, and most often that's going to be caused uh, when you have two thymines right next to each other. Uh, less often by the, when the base cytosine is right next to each other, but apparently just due to the, the structure of thymine, it happens more, more likely when two thymines are next to each other. So when that incoming UV light uh, hits the cell, hits the DNA, um, if there are two adjacent thymines, they tend to bond to each other, which remember shouldn't ever be the case. They should only be bonded with their uh, complementary base pair and not on the same strand. So you can imagine when uh, DNA polymerase three is going along and trying to replicate that strand of DNA, there's gonna be kind of a you know, out pocket or a pucker there. Uh, and it's not going to read that correctly. It's going to make a lot of mistakes. Same thing if this strand is going to be transcribed, the RNA polymerase is, is not likely to read that correctly. So eventually, if you get enough ultraviolet light exposure, eventually the mutations build up and the cell won't be viable anymore. All right. I've cut back a little bit um, on talking about chemical mutag mutagens, uh, but I wanted to make sure I especially mentioned uh, the nucleoside analogs because they have been in the news just this week. So I want to make sure to mention that. Um, a, a nu and I actually changed from what I posted, I, I had posted nucleotide analogs. And if we are going to be more correct here, uh, these examples here are actually nucleoside analogs. So remember, a nucleotide is the, uh, the sugar, the deoxyribose, the base, as well as the phosphate. And the nucleoside is just the sugar in the base. So it's more correct here to say nucleoside. Um, and the first example, I, I crossed it out here because uh, AZT, which is a, one of the first drugs that we had to treat HIV, Apparently now they don't call it AZT anymore. It goes more often goes by the, the kind of trade name uh, that the drug company company has get it, given it, and that's Zidavudine. Zidavudine. I don't even. I never even heard it, it, it that way. Um, but apparently that's the more correct way to call it now. I need to need to update a little bit. Um, what is a nucleoside analog? Let me start there. Um, an analog is something that's very similar to something else. Okay, so these drugs that are nucleoside analogs, uh, for example, AZT or zitovudine, um, looks very similar to um, thymidine, a thymidine nucleoside. Okay. Um, the only difference here is it has an azide group here instead of uh, that three prime hydroxy group, hydroxyl group. 
All right, so basically when the cell is in the presence of, I'm gonna call it AZT, it's easier for me to say, um, it, it the viral um, polymerases are a little bit more indiscriminate in terms of they just kind of will use anything that's even close to looking like a nucleotide and to polymerize it into DNA. Um, this is slightly different. And so when the cells, uh, when the viral polymerase uh, incorporates this, there's not that free hydroxyl group. So it stops replication. No other nucleotides can be added on to that. So this is a way, because it lacks that three prime hydroxyl group, uh, it really slows down the replication of the virus. Um, another chemical mutagen, uh, five bromouracil. So here's, uh, this is from your book here. Uh, it's, this is another analog of thymine. So if you look at the structure of thymine, the only difference between 5-bromouracil and thy thymine is here we've got a um, methyl group and for 5-bromouracil, it's a bromine instead. Uh, we use that as a experimental chemical mutagen. We add that to cells to try to get them to make lots of mutations for, uh, I don't know, experimental purposes, I guess. Um, the one that's been in the news that uh, I was just, you know, became aware of this at the end of last week, so I didn't post this slide. So I just want you to, to pay attention. Uh, don't worry about the details here. But hopefully you've heard about this in the news, molnupiravir. Okay, this is a drug that's on the brink of becoming given an emergency um, okay to be used by the FDA. Um, they've used this drug in a pretty big clinical trial. Uh, they took people that had kind of mild cases of COVID plus one kind of extra risk factor. So uh, maybe they had diabetes or something like that. Uh, and they gave uh, this group of 1,500 people this molnupiravir drug, which uh, is actually can be taken by pill form. This is the first therapeutic for COVID that you can doesn't have to be given as an infusion. Um, and they, you know, looked at what happened. Um, about 14% of the people that were given the um, placebo ended up hospitalized, but only 7% of the people that also had this molnupiravir uh, were hospitalized. So they actually stopped the the trial early because it, at some point it's not ethical to keep giving people a placebo when uh, there's you know such a big um, advantage seen by taking it. Um, so it cut hospitalizations by fifty percent. Um, this is a it's 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 called a citidine nucleoside analog. So here is um, what the citidine nucleoside looks like. And the only difference here, there's just a slight difference up here with the molnupiravir, again, which is, uh, you know, very similar to citidine. So basically, the uh, corona COVID-19 polymerases will incorporate this molnupiravir, and it doesn't. It has it has a three prime hydroxyl group, so it doesn't stop transcription. But because this group up here is a little bit different, the cell when it replicates this base, reads it as pairing with a, uh, a guanine instead. No, that's what it's supposed to be. It, it reads it as pairing with something different. So basically you get catastrophic mutations. So you get uh, so many mutations that eventually the virus doesn't make any um, viable um, copies of itself. All right. So, um, it, you know, this is a class of drug nucleoside analogs that has a lot of potential, um, a lot of toxicity issues, and that's why we don't have a lot of these yet. But this drug has been so far very safe. Question. Uh, okay, so I, if, I think I understand your question. So 
Um, let me just, I said this wrong before, maybe. Um, so, so basically, if, if the citadine, you know, when, when there's the normal um, citadine base, uh, that's going to pair with guanine, right? Anytime it's, it's polymerized into DNA. Well, if, if the molnupiravir is, is incorporated into the DNA instead, it doesn't necessarily bond with guanine. It might bond with an adenine or uh, some other base. So then it, it's basically not the sequence that's supposed to be there to make the viral proteins. Uh, and then you know you'll get something that, that doesn't uh, a, a protein that doesn't work. Yeah. So the nucleus uh, the yeah, so the only difference is there's going to be a phosphate in there, and I don't think that that's usually affected. Um, so with a, a nucleotide, yeah, there's going to be phosphates in there. Right, right, right. So these are drugs that are that are going to look like one of those other nucleosides, either the adenine, the guanine, the cytosine, or or the thymine, or your cell. Yeah. Um, no, they could affect RNA or DNA. Um, it depends. Uh, for instance, so. Coronavirus, it's an RNA virus. So it has to make RNA from RNA, all right? So it actually, coronavirus do, doesn't ever make DNA. So um, it, it's, it's making errors in, in copying its RNA, okay? So yeah, it depends on like, like the, the HIV, um, that virus uses an enzyme to make DNA from RNA reverse transcriptase. So, uh, and that is another enzyme that's usually really indiscriminate in terms of, you know, grabbing anything that looks like a nucleotide. Uh, okay. So, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to beat that to death, but that this, that's the idea behind this drug. And it'll be uh, interesting to see what happens as we move forward. Hopefully it keeps on being safe. And it would be nice to have a pill that would help us deal with COVID certainly. Okay, we don't have a lot of antiviral drugs. All right, um, I just want to talk just a minute. Um, all cells have some kind of, of usually lots of different enzymes that help them correct any mistakes that their polymerases make or any, any kind of mutagens that, that accrue because of some exposure. Um, and I want to kind of gloss over these a little bit. Um, it, I don't worry about exactly um, why we call it this or we call it that. Um, I just want to say that, that cells, again, have enzymes that are going to go through and maybe fix a base that, that becomes altered maybe by some mutagen uh, to cut it out and correct that base. Um, some enzymes are activated by visible light. Okay, those are called photolyase enzymes. So they get their energy from visible light. They move down the strands and you know cut out any bases that are altered. Or we know it's um, photolyases that often repair those the thymine dimers that result from UV exposure. Um, there are other kind of enzymes that uh, don't necessarily need visible light. That they can work in the dark as well that again are gonna excise parts of uh, say the DNA, DNA that um, is damaged. Um, the one kind of repair that I wanna draw your attention to and talk about a little bit more is this mismatch repair because we talked about at the end of DNA replication, uh, there's usually some methylation that takes place. So I wanna, I wanna whoops, pressed too hard there. Um, so I want to talk just briefly how that mismatch repair happens. Okay, um, so here we have um, so two strands of DNA. Here's a here's a replication fork opening up. 
Um, and if you think, remember the directionality, those new strands are always going to be added on the three prime end. So here, this, this top one is actually going to be um, the lagging strand, and the bottom one is, is heading towards the replication fork, if you think about the directionality there. Um, and you can see the old strand here up here is, is methylated, right? Uh, that's a CH3 group. I don't know why they, they say ME for methylated. Okay, so here uh, on the new strand, you can see there's been a mismatch. Okay, so the DNA polymerase theory has actually added a thymine to match with the old strand of guanine. Okay, um, so there's going to be uh, an enzyme that moves down this strand checking for this type of thing. Now, when it comes to that mismatch, how does the enzyme know which is the right one and which is the wrong one? Okay, it can sense that the old strand is methylated. Okay, so the one, the strand that has more methylation uh, is the old one, because the new one was just made and it hasn't been methylated yet. All right, so it's going to fix the new one and uh, put a cytosine in there instead of a guanine. And then eventually the, the new strand is going to be methylated as well. And when it is, then those mismatch repair enzymes that rely on that methylation are not going to work anymore. Okay. So um, that's just a little bit how that works. Um, there's one other kind of, of repair that I'll just mention. Uh, it's the SOS response. This is uh, enzymes that work in E. coli that really um, don't take into much uh, account the template strand. <laughs> so if you get like a break in the DNA where you don't have much of a template, um, there are enzymes that can, you know, basically it's like throwing up a half court shot. The buzzer is going to ring. I don't know, just a chance that maybe the ball will go in the hoop. Uh, these enzymes just kind of indiscriminately throw bases in there, um, just hoping that a few off offspring may still survive. Okay, so um, it has like, I think DNA polymerase four and five are some of these enzymes that, again, don't really need much of a template to kind of make a new strand. All right. All right, so uh, lastly, we're going to investigate a little bit how cells of, in the same generation can share DNA. So vertical gene transfer for is when the mother cell, you know, copies its DNA and, and has, you know, gives DNA to its offspring, daughter cells. Okay, so horizontal is when, you know, gene, two cells that are alive at the same time can pass DNA back and forth. Um, and there's three different ways that we think this happens. We think this all three kinds of horizontal gene transfer are really pretty rare. Maybe only 1% of cells would actually get some kind of gene transferred in this way. But we're going to look at them all uh, individually. Uh, transformation, uh, transduction, and conjugation. That's the one that we have mentioned a few times before. We're going to look at that a little bit more carefully. So. Um, with transformation, let, let's start with this one. This is when cells can take up DNA from the environment. Uh, and you should be thinking, well, when would there ever be DNA in the environment? When bacteria cells die, their, back, their cell wall breaks up pretty quickly. So the, the contents of the cell can kind of leak out into the medium, all right? So DNA from a dead cell will, will kind of leak out into the medium. Um, and then we know sometimes cells would be able to take up that DNA from the environment. Um, again, it's hard to kind of picture how this would happen because DNA is such a large molecule and for it to be able to enter the cell, um, you think that wouldn't happen very often. And we don't think it, it does happen very often. Um, this is one of the hurdles that we had to overcome to introduce the vaccine into our cells. We had to get cells to take up some RNA. Um, we know that this does happen occasionally in nature, more often with some kind of cells than others. 
We can also make this happen in the lab. So when you do this in the lab, uh, you have to make your cells competent. Okay, um, so make cell competence, and that means able to able to be transformed. We can do that. Um, sometimes you hit them with uh, some electric current. Sometimes you add calcium chloride, I think, which uh, again helps enable the cells to take up the, the DNA. Um, how did we ever figure out that this happened? Um, well, that was proved by an experiment done by Frederick Griffith in 1928. When you think about what we knew about DNA in 1928, we didn't know a whole lot. We knew that there was something that transferred, you know, heredity from generation to generation. Uh, we didn't know the structure of DNA or anything about how that it was copied. So uh, I don't know how he even thought to do this experiment, but it, it, this is the experiment that we always point to that proves that transformation can take place. All right, so he used a kind of bacteria called Streptococcus pneumoniae. Uh, and that's an organism that if you're in lab, you're going to use a little bit later on in the semester. Uh, but what we know about Streptococcus pneumonia is it can cause a really, really nasty pneumonia. Uh, sometimes even in humans, deadly pneumonia. Uh, and this is also an organism that tends to make a really beefy capsule. Uh, and without the capsule, it's typically not able to cause an infection. Okay, so it needs that protection in order to establish itself to keep our kind of innate cells from gobbling it up right away. All right, so he had two different strains of strep pneumonia. He had this strain S, he called, he called it strain S because that was kind of the normal wild type strep pneumonia that made these smooth colonies that were, you know, kind of slimy, um, big capsule producers, okay? He also had a mutant strain that was not able to make capsules. So he called that strain R for rough because the colonies uh, weren't as slimy. All right, so this is what he observed, that he took, if he took those live cells of strain S uh, and they're encapsulated and injected them into a mouse, uh, the mouse would die, okay? Again, very serious kind of pneumonia. Uh, he would inject enough uh, that the mouse would die. If he took cells that were heat treated, so the normal wild type capsule producing cells that he killed and then injected them into the mouse, the mouse lived, okay? If they were dead cells, okay, that makes sense. It doesn't get the infection. Um, if he injected mice with that uh, mutant strain that couldn't produce a capsule, the mouse would live as well. Makes sense. Uh, okay, so it, what he did for his experiments here, he took the living strain that can't make a capsule and the dead strain S, mixed those together, injected them into the mice. Oddly enough, the mice, the mice died, okay? You take two things separately that wouldn't cause the mice to die. So what's going on there? Why, why did the mice get the infection. And in addition, he could culture cells of strep uh, pneumonia that made a capsule after the cell, uh, the organism, the mouse died. Okay, so how, how could he explain that, except that these living strain R cells were able to take up the DNA that was kind of leaking out of those dead uh, capsule producing cells, okay? So, and he found that he could make this uh, happen in the lab as well in a test tube in vitro that um, he take the dead heat treated cells uh, of, of strain S and the living strain R and they, they would again take up the DNA that would give them the instructions to make the capsule and he, the transformed cells could then could, could make the capsule. All right, so really a very surprising thing. Okay, the second kind of horizontal gene transfer uh, is transduction. And I know we haven't talked about viruses yet. So we're gonna talk about viral replication. Probably we'll get into that next time. Just know that this 
it involves a virus that is able to infect a bacteria cell. All right, so we call those bacteriophage, literally bacteria eating. Phage means to eat. Okay, so there are viruses that are very specific and that only will attack or target, you know, a very specific strain of bacteria. So, uh, and these, these um, viruses have this really almost kind of robotic lunar lander type look to them, most commonly. All right, so what are these bacteriophages uh, infects the bacteria? Um, what they do typically is, is break down the bacterial, they secrete enzymes that's gonna break down the bacterial chromosome. Uh, and then um, this, the cell, it'll kind of take over the cell machinery, the virus will to make its own viral proteins. Well, every once in a while, maybe some of the bacterial cells DNA will accidentally get packaged into a new virus. Okay, and then when that cell lyses, um, some of that old cells DNA can can get transferred to a living cell. Some bacteriophage can actually do a different kind of replication where they don't kill the cell right away and they actually will incorporate their DNA into the bacteria cell DNA. So it could be that some of this uh, DNA from a uh, another bacterial cell actually gets uh, carried into another bacterial cell and, and inserted into that genome. All right. So that's another thing that we can kind of do on purpose in the lab, a way to kind of manipulate genomes of cells. All right. And thirdly, bacterial conjugation. So I've mentioned this a couple times in class before. Um, this is the only type of horizontal gene transfer where uh, both cells uh, remain alive. Okay, so uh, transform transformation involves a dead cell's DNA entering another cell, or in the transduction, you have a, a cell that's been killed by viruses. Uh, and their DNA transferred. Uh, but here, both cells are alive. And this is going to be uh, mediated by a conjugation helis. OK, so we've talked about this structure as one that especially common among gram-negative organisms. Um, it's a structure that can extend to another cell uh, and then it will kind of retract. So it will bring those two cells closer uh, together. And we think that um, um, an organism is, uh, a cell is only gonna reach out to another cell that does not have the ability to make this conjugation pilus. Okay, so uh, an F plus, that means having a cell that has a fertility plasmid, uh, cell uh, extends that pilus to an F minus cell. Okay, a cell without uh, the fertility plasmid. Okay, we talked about different kinds of plasmids uh, last week. Um, virulence plasmids or bacteriocin plasmids, a fertility plasmid. If an organism has that plasmid, then it enables them to make a pilus. Uh, it can extend to another cell uh, and then make this new cell, which was F minus. Now it'll change that and give it the information so that now that it can make uh, uh, a pilus as well. Uh, so if you look at, um, if you, and this, this can happen between cells of the same species. It can happen between cells of a different species as well. So if you look at kind of what's going on inside of the cell, here you have the S plus, the F plus cell. Um, it's extending a pilus to an F minus cell. We think that that DNA doesn't usually, we don't think it transfers through the pilus. We think that pilus just brings the cells together and a pore opens up between the cells. Uh, and then this, this plasmid 
uh, gets transferred into the F minus cell. Um, and then it, it copies another strand uh, on, on both cells to kind of complete the plasmid. Okay, so now this cell can make a PLUS as well. And hopefully you're thinking, well, what's the so what here? Why would it, why would it just do this if, if a PLUS just makes it able to pass it on to somebody else, some other cell? Well, we think at the same time as maybe passing on the fertility plasmid, that cell might be able to pass on other plasmids as well, like resistance plasmids. Okay, so we think this is the most common way that cells share their ability to be resistant to some kind of antibiotic. Uh, cells that uh, are able to make a conjugation PLUS, they're not only sharing that F plus plasmid, but they're sharing other plasmids as well. Okay, uh, any questions there? Yes. Right, right. So vertical gene transfer, that's what happens, you know, every time a cell divides, anytime it reproduces. Where horizontal is when it's sharing its DNA um, with another cell that's already alive, same generation. All right, uh, so let's move on. Chapter 13, viruses. Uh, I think that hopefully you find this pretty applicable just because of what's in the news every day. Hopefully you're curious about viruses. Um, we're gonna spend probably the rest of our time today just talking about different characteristics about viruses in general. Um, I am gonna talk about some specific viruses, but just as examples. So for now, you know, if I talk about, you know, measles virus or hepatitis B virus or whatever, that's just an example. Later on in the semester, we're going to pick several viral infections and look at them more in depth. And then you'll want to know, you know, exactly uh, characteristics of influenza or whatever. But for now, we're going to talk about a lot of different ones, just as an example. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about then uh, how they're classified. Uh, probably not till next time we'll get into, there's two different ways that virus are replicated. Uh, and then also think about, well, what, what's the difference between viruses that are going to infect bacteria and virus that are gonna, viruses that are going to infect animals, us especially, okay? And then we'll end our discussion talking about prions that are not really viruses, but they are an infectious particle uh, that kind of fits in well there, okay? So... A uh, little overview, I found this slide a while back, it's kind of an old one, uh, an overview of viral infections. So, you know, we could have some interesting discussions thinking about, oh, which infections have you had and which ones have I had? Um, but there's a whole gamut, like viral infections, some of them, uh, you get it and you don't even know you're sick, you don't have any symptoms. Other ones are going to kill you every time. So rabies, we've had, there's been like seven people that we've known of in all eternity that have survived a rabies infection once they start showing symptoms to it. So um, we don't have a lot of good treatments for most viral infections. There are a few exceptions to that. Um, we've made really good progress with hepatitis B and C, with HIV, uh, we're getting better with herpes infections, but we don't have any kind of broad spectrum. Oh, here, this medication works to, for all viral infections. Um, it's a pretty, pretty tough go. Uh, so, um, you know, I was looking at this slide just last week and I was thinking, well, there must, can't viruses do something good? <laughs> Like we talked about how mosquitoes, like, oh, we don't think that mosquitoes are good for anything except, you know, spreading disease. Um, so I, I did a quick Google of this. Um, can viruses benefit humans? Um, they're actually, you know, this one review article, um, if you're on campus, you can have um, access to this by some, through some Grand Valley database. Uh, again, just look at that if you're interesting, but it was kind of an interesting review article in uh, it was like the Annals of Virology or whatever. Um, and it, it did give some examples of how viruses can, can be helpful. Um, 
the easiest one is that yes, viruses can kill bacteria. So we have actually used that for almost 100 years to target certain bacteria. And that's actually used pretty commonly in some parts of the world. Um, but the authors mentioned that there are some symbiotic relationships we know now that viruses can have with many different hosts, like with certain insects or plants or fungi or even animals. Um, you know, and it's, it's kind of a, you know, like the one, oh, if, if a wasp, a, a parasitic wasp is infected with a virus, then its eggs will have the chance to survive in the insect that it lays it in, or, you know, really kind of specific examples of symbiosis. Um, none of them were super convincing that it was really an amazing thing. Um, but the article did point to there is um, a lot of potential for viruses to be used as therapeutic agents for other diseases. So for example, um, there is the hope that eventually we'll be able to use viruses, either natural viruses or maybe um, a slightly modified virus as a vehicle to uh, kill tumors, to, to, to act on cancer. Uh, there's been some work with that. Uh, they might, we might be able to use viruses as a gene therapy tool to treat genetic diseases. Um, and this article that was written in 2017 says um, they may be able to serve as vaccine delivery agents. Okay, check, done that. <laughs> there's, there's quite a few uh, COVID-19 vaccines that actually use a virus to deliver that RNA into our cells. So um, yeah, it's kind of interesting to think about. Uh, maybe we'll get there. We'll appreciate viruses a little bit more someday. Um, I also like to leave this slide up that I posted in when we talked about viruses in February of 2020. So I said to my class, hey, there's this really interesting thing coming out of China. There's this virus. 400 people have died from this virus already. You know, we'll see what happens. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I think like most people thought that this was going to be something that was just going to fizzle out kind of like SARS did 20 years ago, kind of, you know, got a handle on it and clamped down on it. Um, obviously, that's not the case. So I looked uh, up some statistics last week. Worldwide, over 200 million cases, uh, getting close to 5 million deaths. Now, interestingly, those numbers were exactly double from the numbers that I had posted in um, you know, February of this year. So uh, six months after, you know, whatever, we've been dealing with it for a year, those numbers had doubled. Uh, the US cases had also doubled since February. Um, interesting enough, our death rate has slowed down a little bit. And this, uh, I heard yet last night, is over 700,000 now. So I'm out of date as of um, already. But uh, we are getting a little bit better at treating it, uh, you know, for whatever reason, probably because it's more younger people that are getting it now because older people are vaccinated. Our, our death rate has, has slowed down a little bit. Uh, but definitely viruses are often in the news. Uh, here's a nice picture of an Ebola virus. Of course, that was the last big pandemic before this one. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is a slide I've used for years. This is a coronavirus. And, you know, my point was you can have really serious viral infections or you can have like a common cold. Coronavirus is one of the things that causes common colds. Uh, and then here's a, a bacteria phase, a, a bacteria that infects, sorry, a virus that infects bacteria. So just kind of, uh, you know, appreciate the different forms of it. Um, also thinking about the size. Uh, what kind of sizes are we talking about? Uh, it's most appropriate to measure viruses in terms of nanometers. Okay, so we said, oh, bacteria uh, around a, a micrometer. Uh, viruses are quite a bit different or quite a bit smaller. So you compare a red blood cell to kind of a normal bacteria and E. coli, that's the size difference. And then if you take the E. coli and kind of compare it to scale, to viruses, all right? So virus is way smaller. I think they say the very largest virus is comparable with kind of the very smallest bacteria. 
but in general, viruses are going to be way smaller. Um, and in fact, one of the smaller viruses, the polio virus, is pretty similar to the size of the bacterial ribosomes. Okay, so if you want a, a further comparison there. But lots of different shapes, uh, different sizes. So let's think about uh, characteristics. So what makes a virus a virus? Um, I'd say the first thing you should know about viruses is that they can only live, they can only reproduce themselves if they are in a living cell. So, you know, you're not going to be growing viruses in lab uh, on your media, on your nutrient auger in lab, okay? There, there is no way for a virus to reproduce on, on some kind of cell, something that's not alive. So that's kind of the first thing to, to keep in mind. Um, and then there's a few other, you know, things that we can say are true for all viruses. They're going to have some kind of nucleic acid core. So that's either going to be DNA or RNA. Okay, and, and we'll, get, we'll, we'll dig a little bit deeper than that uh, shortly, but uh, the viruses, they're not going to have both. They're either going to have one or the other. Okay, and then that nucleic acid is going to be enclosed in some kind of protein capsid. Okay, so this is a protein shell that serves to protect that genetic material. Okay, so there's always going to be some kind of nucleic acid, and there's always going to be a capsid protecting that nucleic acid. Okay, so this is going to be made uh, of little of proteins called capsomeres. Okay, so all these little circles over here, those are capsomere proteins. Okay, and depending on whether there's another layer surrounding that capsid or whether um, the virus is just the nucleic acid in the capsid. There may be proteins in the capsid here that are going to uh, help it attach to a host. So it might have proteins that are going to make it specific for you know a certain kind of cell in a host. Uh, but some viruses are are enveloped, so they have a membrane encircling them. This is going to be a phospholipid membrane. Okay, where do they get that membrane? Well, they take it from the host cell. Okay, so it's no coincidence that the, that membrane is, it's basically the same as our plasma membrane. Okay, and they don't always get it from the plasma membrane. Sometimes they take it from the nuclear membrane. Um, but that's going to be similar to, to our membranes. Okay. And then just a little terminology, and I try to use these terms correctly. Uh, when it's outside of the cell, we're going to correctly call it a virion. Okay. And that's, that's, you don't hear that term as commonly. Uh, but when the virion then is inside of the cell, uh, basically, if there's an envelope, that gets removed. If there's a, the capsid also gets removed. Okay, so uh, the virus, when you use that term correctly, it's basically just the DNA or the RNA uh, of the virus, okay? Not, not the capsid or the envelope. Uh, and again, some that, those two terms aren't always used correctly because somebody might not know what you're talking about if you talk about a virion. All right, so lots of these different shapes of viruses. And again, uh, I'll give you some examples here. Um, I'm just mostly trying to come across the kind of the, the general uh, shapes or morphologies of viruses. Um, here are, there, there are different ways to kind of categorize these. These are what I most often see. Um, so helical, envelope helical, polyhedral, and envelope polyhedral. And then there's another category, basically catch all for whatever doesn't fit into those other categories, okay? So here's an example. Uh, this is actually the severe acute respiratory syndrome. It's a SARS coronavirus. Um, 
it, this is a envelope virion and it's also got a helical capsid. Okay, so that capsid is kind of, it, it basically looks like a, a straight line uh, inside the virus. Uh, here's some other examples of helical morphologies. Uh, tobacco mosaic virus, again, when you look at this under the electron microscope, they just look kind of like little sticks. Yeah, question? Right, so yeah, that's that's confusing. So when I talk about morphology, um, I'm talking, right, about the capsid morphology. Um, but then if there's an envelope, you know, you, you don't really see that when you look at the, the virion as a whole, right, okay. So uh, here's a helical capsid, again, protecting the, the nucleic material. If it's enveloped, if you've got a helical capsid that's enveloped, it's not going to look helical from the outside, okay, like influenza virus here. Um, a polyhedral capsid, um, as far as I'm aware, there's only one shape. So a polyhedral could be a lot of different shapes, but um, the only shape that I have found uh, in the literature anywhere is, the, is a polyhedron that's an, actually an icosahedral, okay? So this is a 20-sided polygon. All right, so here's an example of what a, a polyhedral capsid would look like. Um, so it's 20 sided. Um, it's made up of 20 equilateral triangles. So remember equilateral, same, uh, same length each side of the triangle. So the reason that this tends to be so popular among viruses is because uh, it has so much symmetry that it, it, it gives it a lot of strength uh, and stability. Okay, because it is so symmetric. Okay. So high, high strength and, and stability. Um, so this is made up of lots of lots of different capsomeres that make up those 20 different sides. Um, the, the capsomeres that are in the corners here, or the ones that are points, uh, are called penton proteins. So these are capsomeres um, at the uh, at the corners or uh, at the points. sorry, corners, or you could say at the points, penton points, that might be easier to remember. Okay, so there's always going to be 12 penton prote proteins, okay, with a 20-sided figure. Uh, and then the hexon proteins, these are the capsomeres that make up the sides. Um, we could say, we could make up the faces, maybe is a better way to say that. Okay, so for example, with this particular, this is a, happens to be an adenovirus, this example of this drawing right here, um, it's always going to have 12 uh, penton proteins, but you can see here, um, this particular one has 240 uh, hexon monomers that make up each face, or no, make the total, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Um, if it's a very small virion, then you're going to have a certain number. You could have more and more if it was a large one, though. Okay, so the number here of hexon proteins is always is going to be different for whatever virus you're talking about. All right, so just a, a little terminology there. Uh, but that icosahedral symmetry is, is quite common. Um, you could have a, a virion with icosahedral capsid, uh, but then be enveloped. So again, the shape doesn't look like that polygon. Uh, 
So here, this is an, this is an example. This is the herpes virion. Um, it has some other proteins associated with it, uh, tegument proteins. Don't worry about that right now. We'll talk about that a little bit later when we get to herpes virus. Uh, and just know then that there are some viral morphologies that don't really fit nicely into any either of those other really two basic categories, um, helical or polyhedral. Um, a bacteriophage, so even though it may have an icosahedral or close to an icosahedral, you can see that this is a little bit elongated here. Um, that doesn't really, we've got these tail fibers in the spindle, so overall the shape is kind of complicated for bacteriophage. Um, this is a smallpox virion over here. Uh, they don't really know how to categorize that. The capsid is, is kind of a very odd shape there. And sometimes uh, this is actually appears a picture of the rabies virion. Sometimes that's considered a uh, complex morphology as well, even though it has a helical capsid, the pro some of the proteins that um, help shape the envelope are so kind of bizarre that it gives this bullet shape uh, to the rabies virion. So oftentimes that's considered complex as well. But, okay. All right. So, uh, Thinking a little bit more, especially about this uh, viral envelope. Uh, again, some viruses have it, some don't, but this is going to be most common in viruses that infect animals. And don't forget, I include us as an animal. <laughs> so we're kind of most interested in viruses that infect us. Okay, so um, comparing that to viruses that infect bacteria. Uh, most bacteriophage don't have an envelope, and I think there might be one or two exceptions there. Um, but again, very common for viruses that infect us to have an envelope. Not all of them, uh, but, but many of them do. Uh, and if a virus doesn't have an envelope, sometimes we call them non-envelopes, sometimes we call them naked, okay? So you hear that both ways. All right, so like I mentioned before, that's acquired from the host. It can be from the plasma membrane, from the nuclear membrane. Um, there may be some glycoprotein spikes. Um, another name for spikes, sometimes you hear these called peplomeres. Okay, but so uh, up on the right hand corner here, here is that adenovirus. You can see this is a naked virus um, and it has some spikes here um, right attached into their capsid. Uh, here's the influenza virus that's got some spikes uh, in, in the envelope there. What is the 